Welcome back, welcome back, welcome back. I'm Miss Lisa. I want you to like, share, and subscribe. I have a goal, a thousand subscribers so that I can do YouTube Live and it be easier. So what this is, is this is my channel for math and science. And um, uh, we do, I do classes for homeschoolers, free online YouTube classes. Um, so all you have to do is like, share, subscribe. But if you like the way I explain this, you are welcome to come listen. Because I know sometimes it's hard to find someone to explain something the way that, that you learn. If you like the way I teach, I have four math classes and four science classes. Pre-algebra, Algebra 1, Geometry, Algebra 2, Physical Science, Biology, um, Chemistry, and Physics. So, this is Physics. Alright, so what we're talking about is thermal energy in this book. If you want to do this as a class, um, you can go look at the introduction or maybe the first chapter, and I think I have the ISBN number of the book I use. It's an older public school book, um, so it's cheap, and it's, the physics hasn't changed. It's the same, so uh, you can just use the, use the cheapness of it. That's why I picked it, because um, it just said it'd be good for homeschoolers. Um, people sometimes ask me, why don't you use Apologia and all of those? A lot of the colleges around here will not take the Christian science textbooks anymore. They won't take um, Bob Jones, Rebecca, all of those. So I just use older public school books and we can learn the science out of them just fine. All right. And so for some of y'all, it might be the book you use are using too, not in my class. All right, so thermal energy. The book starts talking about that in Germany and 1876, a guy named Otto um, figured out the, the engine, the internal combustion engine. That's what we're still using today. We do have some battery um, powered cars now, electric cars um, and things like that, but basically we're burning gasoline in this internal combustion en engine. I heard yesterday in the news that the governor of California said that there will be no gas powered cars in California in the year 2036, I think is what he said. We'll see. I've heard predictions like that before. <laughs> we'll see if it's true or not. Um, I've just lived long enough, see the wrinkles, uh, that um, I've seen, seen things come and go. I remember back in the 70s, on the cover of Time Magazine, they said that, um, that, the, that we were gonna be out of fossil fuels by the year 2000 and that we were going to have to do something else. There were going to be no more cars by the year 2000. Well, it's 2020, and they found more oil fields than ever. They keep discovering more. There's one that they discovered in Israel called the Leviathan oil field. And um, at first they thought it just had natural gas, but now they say it's the world's largest deposit of, of gas, of petroleum, of crude oil. <clears throat> so anyway, they were wrong. <laughs> So, as I've aged, I've become a skeptic. I'm more skeptical about things than I used to be. Y'all are probably all young and sweet and not so skeptical like me. All right, so what is thermal energy? Um, uh, uh, thermal energy it has to do with heat. And what makes something hot? Well, it really goes back to the molecules. All atoms are, by, are moving. If it's the gas, like what's in this room, they're zipping around all over the place. If it's in a liquid, like what's in my water, they're moving around like maybe people do in a crowd, like where you say, excuse me, excuse me, you slide through all the people, you know, you hold the hand of your kid, excuse me, excuse me. It's you trying to get out of the, the concert or you trying to get out of Six Flags or Disney at closing time. That's what the liquid molecules are like and they're moving but this even the solid molecules in this pencil right now this pencil appears to be completely still but if we could be microscopic if we could be like on the magic school bus and go all the way down to see the molecules they would be vibrating they would be in a orderly pattern called a crystal lattice but in that pattern they would be vibrating and if it was a hot um, solid, like maybe a pan I just took out of the oven, then those molecules are moving very, very fast. 
vibrating very, very fast. Not moving around, they're stuck in their pattern, but they are vibrating in it. If it's a cold solid, like maybe something I just took out of the freezer, they're moving more slowly, but they're still moving. There is a point though, theoretically, where all we're, and so things get slower and slower the colder they get. And there is a point theoretically where all motion ceases and it's absolute zero. So um, that's 273. We're gonna learn that it's got some decimal points. Um, negative of Celsius at zero Kelvin. There are different temperature scales. There's Celsius that we think of as the metric system. Um, so like room temperature in Celsius is about 20. Water freezes in Celsius at zero and water boils in Celsius at 100. In Georgia, where I am, we're more familiar with Fahrenheit, the English or imperial system. And um, at that, water freezes at 32. Body temperature is 98.6. Room temperature is about 70. And water boils at 212. So, um, so and then there's another temperature system called Kelvin, named after Lord Kelvin, who was an early... Um, scientist who um, discovered stuff about heat and um, with his system it's the same exact one as Celsius as far as how big the degrees are the difference is where it starts and Kelvin starts at absolute zero and has no negative numbers where Celsius has negative numbers just like we do in Fahrenheit okay. <laughs> did you get all that I hope so <laughs> okay um, energy can be transferred through conduction and that's where you've got all your molecules and they're bumping over here and they're bumping so wild that they bump into these and they start bumping and then they're bumping so wild they bump into these and they start bumping i always think of it like back in the 80s it was a very big deal and in the 90s to have what was called the mosh pit my husband was a professional musician and we went to a lot of concerts and some of those were concerts that had a mosh pit and it was where in the front all the people were dancing around very very energetically and they would bang into each other they would like jump and smack and they were just like molecules well if you had someone standing at the edge and they weren't planning on being in the mosh pit but they get knocked into it then that would sort of be like um energy transferred heat energy transferred by by conduction one knocks into the other and gets it going and we see this like imagine you have a metal spoon and you hold it into a candle well eventually you're going to let go of that metal spoon because the heat will be go through conduction through the metal spoon until ah, you burn your hand and you let go of it okay another way we can have is called convection i always think it sounds like confection which makes me think ooh, bakeries yummy things to eat there's a really good bakery in Rome, Georgia, not too far from here, called Honeymoon Bakery. Mmm, delicious. Anyway, focus. Um, convection, not confection, is you can think of it as blowing. So, like, um, if you want to transfer heat, and say you've got a fan, and you've got some heat source, like some a fire or some glowing coals or something, you had a fan blowing, it would make the heat spread faster by the movement of the fluid. Now, fluid, what do you mean? In physics, both liquids and gases are considered fluids because they act the same way. They can both get currents, they can both be blown around, so they're both considered fluids, and both of them can blow and heat be transferred. So you can have like the Gulf Stream is moving through the ocean. That would be convection as it brings heat from the Gulf up to England to keep England nice and, and warm through the winter. Um, but also, the, they are ovens called convection ovens, and they're just a regular oven that has a fan. And the fan makes the, 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 the air in the oven move around, and it cooks the food faster. They, they really caught on in England. I watched the Great British Bake Show, and they turned those fans on and cooked their food fast. I remember when they got here, like maybe in the 80s or the 90s, it was a big push for convection ovens, but they just didn't catch on here. People weren't too excited about that technology. I don't have a convection oven. Most people I know don't. Maybe maybe you do, and you, and you know all about turning on that fan to make it cook faster. I think people here think, 
mm, if I'm going to cook from scratch and put it in the oven, I want it to taste good. So I want it to be just like my mama made it or my grandmama made it. So, and she didn't have a conviction oven, so I'm not going to use one of those either. Now, but we all have embraced the Instant Pot, which uses pressure to make the temperature go up higher than boiling point. Remember I told you water boils at 212. So normal cooking does not get hotter than 212 because once it starts boiling, it doesn't get hotter until all liquid has boiled away. So there's a, a cap on how hot it can get. If you put it under pressure like an Instant Pot, then you can raise the temperature of the cooking and it and it cooks faster. So yeah, Instant Pot's catch stock has caught on though, much more than the convection oven. And I have I have an Instant Pot and I'm still learning. It's got a learning curve. There are a few things that I can cook good at, but some things I'll cook and go, nah, nah, this is not good. <laughs> um, all right, but I know some people who I think are great at the Instant Pot. I, I'm I'm still a student. All right, the third way that heat can be transferred is through radiation. That's how the sun heats the earth. The sun burns with radiation. It goes through space where there are no molecules. There is no fluid to, to convect. There are no molecules to conduct. There's nothing but the radiation, electromagnetic radiation energy passes through space and heats us our earth by radiation and there would be no life on earth without it. All energy on earth comes from the sun because the plants get their energy. They store their energy as food for them and for us. The, the, the sun heats up our oceans. It heats up our atmosphere. So um, all of the, the big planet wise energy, of course there's other energies here, but um, the big planet energy comes from the sun. All right, so what is thermal energy and what is temperature. Um, if something is hot, it has a high kinetic energy. If we consider something cold, its average kinetic energy would be less. So, um, and heat always flows from something that has more heat to, to less heat, from hot to cold. Now, this is the little semantics thing. Cold is a word we use in everyday language, but in, from the physics point of view, it doesn't really exist. It's just a lack of heat. So if something's cold, it's cold because it has no heat energy. So a long time ago, I used to teach um, in public school, and I had a boy that I taught in ninth grade physical science, and I taught, taught him that cold doesn't exist. It's just a lack of heat. And this child, this is Georgia, this child was very country, and he'd say, no, Miss Blackburn, that ain't so. Cold exists. Cause, no, ma'am, I feel it. <laughs> I'd be like, no, it's just like heat. No, I'm sorry, ma'am. I hate to disagree, but cold exists. I can feel it. So then it got to be biology and, you know, I tried to teach him the next year. He had me again for biology and I don't know why we talked about thermal things, but we did and I still did not convince him. The next year I taught him chemistry. So here it is three years in a row. I have been his teacher and what do you learn about chemistry but energy? And I told him that cold didn't exist and he said, no, that ain't so, ma'am. I'm sorry, ma'am, but cold exists. I can feel it. Senior year, who did he get for physics? Me. I taught this child four years. He never had another high school science teacher but me. And um, taught him physics, and I said, cold does not exist. It's just a lack of heat. And he said, no, ma'am. I'm sorry to disagree, but no, ma'am. Cold exists. I can feel it. So I wonder, Kenny, wherever he is out there, uh, did he ever get convinced that cold doesn't exist? I bet not. <laughs> I bet he's like, I had a crazy teacher in high school and she said cold doesn't exist. They used to think cold was an invisible blue fluid. How can it be invisible blue? I don't know. I just read it. I'm repeating what I read. And a lot of times you'll see it just an invisible fluid. But they thought it would fly through the air, like, you know, fluid, fluid could be air or water. Or it could go through the water and get in you. And, that, and that's how you catch cold. The, whole, the cold would get in you. And they thought cold was a thing. But then they figured out it's a lack of heat energy. So, um, next idea. Um, the difference in temperature and heat energy. Okay, so temperature is a measure of the average kinetic energy of something. Um, it is the average kinetic energy. 
the um the the heat that is contained in so and the temperature does not depend on mass at all doesn't matter if you got a little something that's that temperature or a big something that's that temperature it's that temperature you measure it with a thermometer heat energy includes you can think of it as including all that kinetic and potential energy that's in the body so it would include the energy that is the potential energy stored in the chemical bonds so and it depends on mass so the more mass something has the more energy the more heat it would have so i always ask kids this question which would have more heat a teacup full of boiling hot water or the ocean full of 30 degree water it's, it's cold it's 30 degree it's, it's gonna be a cold ocean and the students always say the teacup because it's boiling hot and the answer is no the ocean because the ocean has more mass it has more heat energy it has more combined kinetic and potential energy so uh, get that in your head okay um uh, so if you have something hot and something less hot, we won't call it heat, cold, the energy will flow out of the hot thing into the cold thing. When they finally get the same temperature, it is said to be thermal equilibrium, that the heat is not flowing one way or the other anymore, it stays where it is. And you know, we all know that, if you're cold, what do you wanna do with your hands? Go put them on somebody and get your hands warm, make them scream, <laughs> suck some of that heat out of them into your hands. Oh, is that just me, not y'all? Y'all y'all like put on gloves, no, I go, Try to find someone to touch. See if one of my kids I can touch their arm. <laughs> and y'all are all being glad that I'm not your mama. Okay. Um, we already talked about the temperature scales, Celsius and Fahrenheit and Kelvin that's in your book. Um, so if you're converting from Celsius to Kelvin or Kelvin to Celsius, you just have to remember that the difference is your book does the whole thing, 273.15 degrees. Some books will just say 273. So the Kelvin, Kelvin equals the Celsius plus 273. And if you just remember that it, at zero Kelvin, it's negative 273 Celsius. But we'll do those problems in the set part two, the math, okay? The next is the formula for heat. So heat has a formula and it is, let me find my marker here. The way I, sometimes it's drawn as a H, sometimes as a Q. I don't know why. Q for quit, no heat. And the formula is MC delta T. So it looks like mm cat. This is a mm cat. It's not really an A, but it's a delta and it kind of looks like an A. It looks like mm cat. So the heat, we can make it into a cat, and then you can remember that heat is mm cat, the formula. And uh, I've had kids come back years later. Oh yeah, Miss Blackburn, I was in college, I remembered heat is mm cat. Um, all right, so what is this? M is the mass, remember I told you heat has to do with mass. C is this thing called specific heat. It is a physical property of the substance. You might not have ever heard that before, but you already know about it. You know that certain things, if you touch them, are going to burn you and the other ones aren't. For Let me, let me explain. Um, imagine if I had a pan on the stove and I turned it on, but I didn't put anything in it. It hit, heat up really fast, wouldn't it? And then if I saw it and I took it off, it would cool down really, really fast. Now imagine that I have a, a pot full of water and I heat it up. Is it gonna heat up as fast? No, it's gonna take at least 10 minutes to get that water boiling. But I heat it up and that water's boiling and I move it off the stove. Is it gonna cool down as fast as the empty pan? No, it's gonna take forever. That water is gonna hold the heat for a long time. The reason why is because metal and water have a different specific heat. Water has a higher specific heat, which means it takes a more time to heat it up and more time for it to cool off. If you, now see, I used to always use this illustration and it worked, but lately it hasn't been working and I think it's because some of y'all are not doing enough chores. Because I'll say, do you, have you ever gone to unload the dishwasher, you will, you know about specific heat? And the kids are like, no. 
And I'm like, you need to get in there and unload the dishwasher or at least wash them. Um, this is, this is, if you have your just finished dishwasher full of hot dishes and you reach in there to get something out, um, different things hold the heat longer. So the thing that you can get out of there first are the metal things. The spoons, they're not all that hot. They're going to cool off fast. The metal pan. The next thing you're going to take out of there might be the wooden things. They might come out pretty quick too because they don't hold heat. But then the, the things that are going to still be hot for longer are ceramics and glass. So the, and the ceramics will cool off first and the glass cools off last. It has a higher specific heat. It takes more heat to heat it up and it'll hold that heat longer. So think of that. Now let's go back to water. Um, if water did not have a high specific heat, we would have no life on this planet. It's because our earth is covered in water. So during the sun day, the sun's radiant energy shines on the earth. Other planets that don't have water get too hot and it couldn't support life. But because of our water, the water keeps absorbing all the excess heat from the sun and we're kept nice and cool during the day. Not too hot, we can we can have life. At night, um, on other planets with no water, it gets way too cold. The sun goes away and it plunges to hundreds of degrees below zero where people cannot live. That would be Fahrenheit, not, not Celsius or maybe Celsius, I don't know. But it's too cold for people at night. And so you wouldn't, and you certainly couldn't go from the extreme temperatures so, from so hot to so cold. But we're covered with water. So when our earth turns away from the sun, all that radiant energy that was stored by the oceans all day long, it gives back at night. So it, it makes our, our world nice and warm on the back side of the earth when, when then we turn away from the sun. So it's really a, a, a miracle of life that we are a water-based planet. We could not have a life on our planet without the high specific heat, the sea of water being high. Now, the definition of specific heat is the amount of heat needed to heat one gram of water one degree Celsius. Uh, that's the one we usually use in chemistry. Sometimes they do the kilogram one instead in physics books, but um, I've taught chemistry longer than physics. Well, I've taught them the same time, but I was a biochem major in college and I took a lot of physics but not as much. I've got more biology and chemistry than physics. I took extra physics just because I thought it was fun. <laughs> I did. I took more than I needed. I could have taken like art and I'd go take another physics class because I thought it was interesting. It was fun. I like physics. I got to take astronomy and go look through the big high-powered microsco uh, microscopes, <laughs> telescopes, the other one, <laughs> the big one. All right, so we talked about specific heat. We'll do a problem with that. You're going to do a lab. Um, we talked about MCAT. Um, calorimetry. Okay, so you can measure the heat chain that, that is lost by one thing and gained by another in a thing called a calorimeter. Now, I used to have some the first time I used to teach public school, and that was really just a fancy name for a styrofoam cup with a lid and a hole for the for the uh, thermometer. But the how the labs go is you measure out a certain mass of water, put it in the cup, take its temperature, write it down, heat up some metal, get its mass, um, throw it in the cup. Then the water will warm up. The heat lost by the metal is gained by the water. And so then you can do the math and you can find out how much heat was lost by the metal because eventually it will reach equilibrium where they're the same temperature. So we will do some problems like that in the second video. The way I set up that problem is a little different than the way the, the book does, but um, I think my way makes more sense because it helps you realize what's gained by one is lost by the other. You set them equal and solve for the thing you don't know. All right, so change of state. States of matter, solid, liquid, gas, plasma. We're going to just talk about solid, liquid, gas. Plasma is in the stars and in fluorescent lights, and we're not going to talk about it right now. Uh, we're going to talk about more change of state with um, regular, regular things that are more common on Earth. That's what we care about. All right, so I'm going to draw you a little graph. If you 
have something that is solid, like solid ice. And you heat it up, it gets warmer and warmer and warmer until the ice starts melting. And then it will stay the same temperature until every bit of the ice melts into water. And then it will heat up again. The water will heat up, heat up, heat up. I want to make sure I'm not leaving the thing. And then it will start becoming a gas. And it will stay the same temperature the whole time until every bit of that water becomes a gas. And then it will heat up again. Where you add heat and, um, and it heats up is called latent heat. Where you, I mean, sensible heat uh, is sensible heat. Where you add heat to it and it doesn't heat up is called latent heat. So it's sensible latent, sensible latent, uh, sensible. And so this is the big takeaway here. That when it undergoes phase change from solid, liquid, gas, all the energy as it's going to phase change goes to break the forces of attraction or the bonds and like here it's breaking it out of its crystal lattice and here it's breaking it out of its liquid forces of attraction so it can go fly around and be a gas. All the energy goes for overcoming those forces of attraction and none goes for temperature increase. The temperature only increases when it's all in the same phase. So ice water is always zero degrees as long as there's some ice in there at zero degrees. Boiling water is oh, Celsius. Boiling water is always 100 degrees. It's 32 degrees um, Fahrenheit and to 12 degrees Fahrenheit. So that's why um, the Instant Pot. With the Instant Pot, it, 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 it can go on up. It doesn't get stopped by that 212. And it, the, what causes that 212 is a relationship between the pressure of the atmosphere and the bubbles forming in what's boiling. So if the, if it's um, if it tries it, the atmosphere squishes it back down again, so that's that. Okay, boiling heat, heat of evaporation. It is the this is the uh, heat of vaporization when it becomes a vapor. This is called the heat of fusion where it becomes a solid. Where it goes from solid to liquid is called melting point. Um, where it goes from liquid to gas is called boiling point. So I think we're going to do some um, where we are. I think we will do some um, uh, good um, problems with that. So we'll do problem five and six with that. All right. The first law of thermodynamics. Um, thermal is total increase in the thermal energy of a system is the sum of the work done on it and the heat added to it is called the first law of thermodynamics. Um, uh, so it's just there are certain laws of thermodynamics and remember laws beat theories. They're so true they're math and you end up getting to do math problems on it. I don't know if we're going to do a math problem on it though. It looks like maybe not. Okay, then it talks about how an engine works. So for a car engine, it's if you've got this chamber, the piston down at the bottom. It will the in the chamber it will squirt some gasoline. It's more fun with sound effects, kind of making it a vapor. Then the spark plug will go and light it, and it explodes. And that causes the piston to be pushed down. As these pistons push down, they don't do it all at the same time. They do it at different times. And then there's this like thing that turns and it turns at different points as it's pushed down by the pistons. And that causes th this thing under your car to turn. And then that energy is converted to make your wheels go. So um, I don't know if your book talks about it too much, but yeah, I'm sure you can look it up on the internet. Um, another thing it talks about is how do refrigerators work, if, you know, that's with heating and cooling. Um, how refrigerators work is they have a chemical in them. And this is a chemical that can absorb heat. So it absorbs the heat out of your refrigerator. And then it takes it the, in, through these coils and it takes it and this chemical changes between gas 
and liquid. And when it does that, it's giving off the heat. And that heat gets blown out underneath your refrigerator. I don't know if you've ever noticed, but underneath your refrigerator in the front, you can feel warm air being blown out. And it's air that was taken at the warmth that was taken out of your refrigerator. So we went to a museum about that. You know, homeschoolers. We, it was in Pensacola, Florida. There is a museum to the guy who was the scientist who figured this out. And we went to his museum. I don't know if it's still there because a big hurricane hit Pensacola not too, or was it Appalachicola? It's down there on the Cola coast of Florida in the Panhandle. And um, there was a huge hurricane that hit right there after that. So hopefully they still have that museum. It was it was interesting. That's a fun field trip. You get to go to the, to go to the beach and go learn a little science. Um, okay, so the second law of thermodynamics is also called entropy. And what it says is that things move from order to disorder unless acted upon by an outside force. So like your room, unlike Mary Poppins, it does not clean itself up. If you just kind of leave it alone, it ends up getting messier and messier unless acted upon by an outside force, you go and clean it up. A, a better example than that one is there's one where a, a tractor is left out in the field. And if this tractor is left out in the field, eventually it is going to decay and fall apart it's not going to reassemble itself into a nice new um, uh, tractor unless acted upon by an outside force. I watch a show sometimes called Rust Bros, and it's about these guys in Canada. And this one guy named Mike uh, has got a big old field full of old cars that are just rusting. But he goes and he'll pull them out, and then they get all the rust out of them, and they work really hard and make them all beautiful and restore them. And I like seeing the old cars and the designs. And they're pretty funny, Mike and his assistant, Avery. I think they use bad language, though, so don't watch it unless your mama says you can. Okay, they might bleep it all out, but they're cussing Canadians. <laughs> they are, <laughs> but it's funny. But anyway, those cars are not going to restore themselves. It's going to take Mike and Avery because of the law of entropy. Things do not move from... Uh, disorder to order unless acted upon by an outside force. So that's a little bit of a problem for one of our ideas in science. One of our ideas is Big Bang and evolution, and both of those ideas sort of go against this idea of entropy. Both of those ideas um, have disorder, a Big Bang, causing order, planets, worlds, all of those things, and a world full of primordial muck and things like that, more disorga disorganized, becoming you an amazing amount of organization. If you want to know, just take anatomy and you will be blown away by the organization in one of your cell walls. What the hydrogens do in your cell walls. Oh, I took this class in college called molecular cellular biology. It was a biochem class. This big, thick, I mean, it was like that thick. Black book. Ugh. I would spend 20 hours a week writing up the lab. Not, and another 20 hours a week, sometimes in the lab. Oh, that class was so hard. And it's because biochem is so complicated because you are so organized. So um, that's a little bit of a problem. That shows you that we don't know everything about this. And biologists do recognize this, and um, they have some theories about it, which you can study in another class. This is not biology, this is physics. So just to let you know, though, that sometimes different disciplines go, hmm, I'm not sure if that's right, or, oh, that needs more study before we have the right answer about that. So, but... Just know that is, the, it's called the second law of thermodynamics or entropy. And it is a law. It's not, and it's got math and it's got the math you can do and it's got equation and a formula and all that. And um, so you, that your book has the, uh, it's got the, the bedroom, um, not the Russ Bros shop. All right. So that is it for chapter 12. Come back for part two and we'll do the math. Yay! Uh, Miss Lisa, like, share, subscribe. Science is great. Math is great. Physics is great. 